pretty wild to look at this group. Um, seven years ago, uh, we were pretty close to bankruptcy and I think like, like Ed said, there were 60 people here and 50 of them were throwing stuff at me. So this is a lot, lot safer crowd. And, uh, you know, it's been really enjoyable to uh, not have to have the ankle bracelet on anymore and to have the bodyguards in front of me. So it's nice to, to be free and be able to move safely around the, the, the user conference. So um, uh, what I really wanted to do is um, uh, do two things. Uh, first of all, the company is going through a branding exercise, and uh, as part of that, um, we want to really document the Descartes story, and, and uh, so they asked me if today when, when I was speaking with you, I would, you know, document the Descartes story. Um, and, and, and for me, it's been about a journey, um, you know, and, and, and I'm, I, I'm 27 years into a quest, and, and, and that, that quest you know, started uh, when I was on the shipping dock. And I was trying to work my way through university and I would unload trucks every day. And uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, I'm dyslexic. And uh, I have a photographic memory, um, which is a kind of a, a strange combination. Um, and I, 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 I was able to at least use this to some advantage. I would sit at night when everyone was gone and I would open the PO file drawer and I would take a picture in my head of every PO. And you know, I unloaded the trucks long enough to know that when they said the fans were coming in uh, or the fertilizer was coming in, I had either a, a light thing of air that was gonna take up all of my space or I had a big bag of, oh, I can't say that, fertilizer that was coming in that was going to weigh a ton and all the pallets were going to fall over while I was unloading them and sp split open and spread that stuff all across my shipping dock. And so I knew from reading a file cabinet and spending a lot of experience unloading this stuff, kind of what I thought my day would be like and more importantly what room I didn't have. So then I'd rush around and figure out, you know, how to move this from over here and re-slot this over there and move some stuff forward and move some stuff backwards so that I could run my day. And uh, the good news is, is that worked until our sales exploded. And once our sales exploded, which is what happened, that didn't work. And it was just chaos. And, and uh, so I was just dumb enough to drop out of university and start a software company that was going to try to solve this problem. And uh, for those of you who know me, you know, the truth was I, I, I moved in uh, to the ghetto in where I was from onto the Indian reservation into a rooming house. And I worked three jobs. Um, I, I, I worked on the shipping dock uh, during the day. On the weekends, I work overnight uh, to stock shelves. And then in between, I was a, a shop lifter catcher guy. And that was, that was my fun, you know. Got to play a little cat and mouse every day. Um, and, and, and from there, I saw the whole experience no longer from the distribution perspective, but I also saw it from the floor perspective, you know, within the stores. And I really realized uh, it, was, it was pretty messed up. So I set off on a quest and, 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 and this journey. And um, today to see, you know, so many of you on this journey with me is really cool. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm so happy to see that um, there's a lot of people who want to take this journey with us. And, and the, the question has become, you know, now I'm asked all the time, you know, how, how did, what happened here? You know, how did you do this? You know, what's the story behind the company? And it starts on the shipping dock, you know, not being able to see, not being able to do our job. And, you know, I saw really, if you go back on the timeline, I saw a few different things. First of all, deregulation had just happened, if anyone's old enough to remember this. And so, 
Now we didn't need to have authority to move freight. And it seemed quite obvious to me that we could connect uh, you know, a bunch of shippers with some air freight pickup and delivery guys and you know, broker some you know, truckloads into specific lanes and then go scoop up all the LTL freight that was on those shipping docks, consolidate them and make a lot of money. And you know, we were making a yield of about $2,800, $2,800 a load on a 400 mile move at $1.12 a mile. So, you know, we were making extremely good money with this assetless system that just connected everyone together and did some LTL consolidation. And this was right at the beginning of DREG. You know, the, today this is a $500 million division of C.H. Robinson. Um, but back when this was started, you know, nobody really knew much about what this was. Well, once again, for me, I was more interested in what was giving me a hard time. And what was giving me a hard time was that we didn't have ways to communicate data. So our shippers would have what we call material call-off orders. And those call-off orders would get sent to a supplier and the supplier would ship against them. But there wasn't any way to electronically send that call-off order to me as a logistics company who might want to consolidate that freight with other freight so we would want the visibility into the call-off orders to be able to know what people would want for us for trucks and be able to try to broker the move and, and create consolidation. So we needed something that we called EDI. Um, back then we didn't have EDI. I hire a guy to take from control data to take a 20 megabyte tall grass hard drive. This is an age test again, but some of you will remember these devices. And they were part of the first PCs. And this external drive, then we had to make software to couple into the modem and put that thing into the suction cup thing and you know, have data be able to be stored so that it could be forwarded. Much later on, they built something called X25 and store and forward networks, and it became pretty commonplace to do what you know, many of you know as EDI or EDI mailboxing. It only took about 15 years, right? And, and, but what we've learned is, is it takes about 15 years from when innovation you know, is, is started and when it's mainstream. And not everyone should be an early adopter, but some people should. We have 35 companies out of our 7,000 that want to do things that have never been done before. They partner with us to do that. We innovate. And 10, 15 years later, what they do is mainstream, and they get quite an advantage in the middle. The second thing I saw when I started to put the assetless networks together was we didn't have any TMS you know, systems. You know, we didn't have any way to rate and route and produce bills of lading and account for shipments and then do the distribution of costs across multiple shipments with multiple parties. We didn't have the ability to allocate freight costs down to SKUs or product classifications. Or, you know, and I said, well, you know, if we're going to network these systems together, we're going to network these systems together. We need to, you know, have some some way of using the data, rates, routes, costs, you know, geographic information. And remember the Rand McNally database. By the way, Pete Stiles, the founder of that, is here today. Um, you know, ALK, who does a lot of that work today, is one of our partners. But none of these things were put together, and and so I started a company to put these things together. Started the building the first EDI systems in our industry, started building the first TMS systems in our industry. And, and then as the industry started to evolve, I realized that uh, we had some problems. And, and, and the real, real problems had to do with what I'll call the great big lie. And the great big lie had two groups of people lying to everybody. The first group of people was the three PLs. They were running around telling everybody that they have the best systems in the world and they can do everything you want to do and they're seamlessly interconnected with all of their partners across the globe and all you have to do is give them their stuff. And of course the reality was they weren't any more interconnected than anyone else on the planet and they probably didn't even do a better job. The second group of liars, which was the one that concerned me the most, was the ERP vendors. Because the ERP vendors were walking in and say, yeah, we can do everything you need to do for supply chain and logistics and just give me the contract to put in my ERP system and we have everything that you need. As long as you don't want to constrain your materials, 
as long as you don't want to have anything that allows you to ship your systems, and as long as you don't have anything that wants you to automatically pay. So you can't buy it, you can't ship it, and you can't get it paid for. But as long as those three things are fine, you can use our ERP system. I, I, when, I, when I went to Gartner, you know, the quest was really to stop the madness, as Kramer would say, and state the facts, which was ERP systems were about enterprises. And what we do in logistics is, is about extending enterprises and inner enterprises. And it's not about the functionality of a system. It's about the cooperation of many systems needing to work together. In global trade, the number of parties between the broker and the forwarder and the carrier and all of their documents needing to be submitted. And God bless if you do business under LCs where all of that has to come together into some notion to trigger payment. And all of these things are distributed problems. They're all problems of inter-enterprise or distributed computing in simple terms. And no one was really telling the truth. No one was really telling or defining or setting the table for what needed to happen, which was a federated network system. And during my time, I, I, I was able to start to crystallize um, through building a system for the US military in the global transportation network that the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, they all need to work together. <laughs> but they don't really like each other too much. It sounds to me just like the CPG supply chain, by the way. I think it's basically the same situation. You know, everyone needs each other, but no one likes each other too much. And, and, and so you have to build a system in, 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 in military command. You have to build a system that allows everybody to share information, but nobody really wants to share information. They all want to work together for the common good, but in the end of the day, they want to go back into their own foxhole and figure out their own problems. And then when you think about it, the Marines are the police for the Navy in the first place. For some notion of policing, they don't want them to see the data either. Sounds like some CPG and retail companies I know. You know, the problem was really the same. Everyone needs to work together, but, you know, everybody really wants to optimize their own agenda on the side. So to create a notion that everyone would just have this one computer system, which everyone uses, that's not really real. Okay, that was the internet bubble. That was as big a fallacy as everyone was going to use the ERP system would be that there'd just be one system that sits in the cloud somewhere and then everyone would use that. Well, that's, that's just as crazy. Because the reality is, is everyone's going to have their own computer systems and other people, everyone's going to have systems where they need to share information with others. And there's a difference between public data, which we're all experiencing now in social networks, and private data, which we all understand because our IT department guys always talk about the thing behind the firewall. And then there's this thing in the middle, which is kind of private, kind of public. Sometimes you'll share it, sometimes you won't. And it's in that middle ground where there's really a type of computing called federated computing, where other computers are connected to your computers. And together in a network of networks, there are many computers connected that allow you to do your private stuff, you to do your public stuff, and someone in the middle who can police the difference between the public and private when people want to go access information. And we start that definition work in 1991, and I started building systems in it in 1993. And I just saw last year, finally, um, after a very long journey, uh, a lot of discussion at the industry level about the next generation of cloud computing referred to as Web 3.0 or federated networks. And you know what we've learned is that it takes 15 years from when we start these things uh, to when they become mainstream. Um, the good news is what we've learned is right and we're building a, a very great business. And, and, and so when it comes to Descartes' story, it's really been about a journey for me. And in 2004, I was asked to take over as CEO, and all of you have joined that journey. And to have you join the journey with us is, is amazing. Now, in 2004, you know, when I was asked to, to take over, I said, well, we need a strategy, and defined what we call the resources in motion management strategy. And I remember this really vividly because I sat down with Ed, and Ed looks at me and he says, well, yeah, that's great, but I'm not going to go sell that. 
I don't, I'm not gonna go sell rims. I'm gonna go sign up a bunch of people for the you know, customs filing systems that are coming up. And I'm gonna go sell a little more roadshow. And, and, uh, and I'm like, okay, you know, that's fine. Because uh, we, we're smart enough to know that you know, we're not gonna wake up the first day and, and, and sell something that's not gonna sell. But I also vividly remember 12 months later making this RIMS presentation to Kraft. And at the time, Kraft didn't like us very well. And uh, that's, that's because we deserved it. And I had a discussion with Kraft and I apologized and you know, had my confession and you know, explained to him for a Jewish guy to do a Hail Mary, it's a big confession. So I hope everyone somewhat appreciate you know, what's going on from my side of the table? And, and they did, and, and the comment they made, and I don't know if some of you in the crowd were here uh, about 18 months ago, at a, were at a conference that we had where Kraft spoke, and Kraft said, when they walked into the room, they showed us a vision that 10 years from now is what we want it to be, and the kind of companies we want to do business with are the ones that will show us a vision of the kind of company we want to be. And I thought, okay, you know, that's good. That, that, that's pretty good. I, I didn't have to pay him to say that in front of my investors. I didn't have to give him any discounts off of future business to have him say that in front of investors. And the truth is that's exactly what you want your investors to hear. You know, we're a public company, right? So our drill is a little different too. What we need to do is we need to show all the people that invest in us that there's a value in the future of our business that's bigger than the business today because stocks and capital markets value forward. And just so we're clear, you know, my job is to make the shareholders money, right? I mean, that is the job. It doesn't really work any other way. And, and the way to make shareholders money is actually first for have them understand the future value of the business. And then the second thing is to show them happy customers who want to join your journey. And just so we're clear, because we're all, you're, you're my user group, so we can talk candidly here. It is in that order. It is in the order of the shareholders have to give us the mandate. And then based on that mandate, we get to work with you and execute. And you, we join that journey together as one learning team. And that's been a great opportunity for us. Off of the back of the success of some of you, the Descartes dozen, the first couple years, the first year and a half, we targeted 12 companies that were industry leaders in their market. And we went to them and said, hey, you know, if it doesn't work, you don't have to pay, which seven years ago was quite novel, right? We didn't have salesforce.com commercials going on back then. Um, you know, so that Tom Lifson wins the bet from last night's dinner, I will now mention how I fired the whole Salesforce. Because I did fire the whole Salesforce in May 2004 because I didn't want a culture of selling, I wanted a culture of serving. And I told all the engineers that we don't sell software, we sell results, so go make your stuff work. And when it works, we'll get paid, and if it doesn't work, we won't. And we'll go to industry leaders. And then I had a famous conference call where one of the Wall Street boys says, well, how is a company gonna grow when it doesn't have sales reps? I said, wow, pretty simple, you know, there are, we're gonna do a good job and our friends are gonna tell their friends. And I, I, you're just like silence, they're like, well, you know, that's just so unnovel. I mean, are you going to hire 40 quota carrying sales reps and do some math and then show me how you're going to grow from 40 million to 80 million in a year because every sales rep's going to sell five of what we got? And I said, no, actually, I'm just going to fire them all and I'm going to make the customers we have happy and they're going to tell their friends and I don't know how fast I'm going to grow and I don't really care as long as I get better every year. And for those of you who've been with us, you know, we're highly imperfect company. Uh, highly imperfect company. What we do as a living is highly imperfect. It's new stuff. It doesn't always work right. Things fail. Um, you know, most of you have IT shops that um, have exactly the same problem. Um, you're just as imperfect. We're all imperfect. We're in an imperfect profession. It's not jet engines like the GE commercial guys. That's a perfect profession. And, and because of that, we need to have a culture which isn't about what we said we were gonna do when we got there, it's about what we do once we've learned what we're really looking at and how we get there. And the biggest judge of a company like ourselves isn't what happens when we sell you something, it's what happens when something goes wrong. And what do you do to fix it? And what's your culture to get it right? And you know, when I talk to our customers, some of you in this room who've been with us 
through this whole process. You know, our CVS, who's just been a great partner, you know, winners. Um, many of you have seen these imperfections, um, have, you know, accepted them, have commented to me on the culture of the company being one that never stops, and sooner or later we always get it right. And by creating that culture of serving, we were able to start building a successful business. And, and today, we're actually seven and a half years from when the RIMS model was produced, and we're probably another seven and a half years before it's mainstream. But I know from all of you who've sold out the demand and capacity in our company to serve you, which I think is fantastic, that we know we're right, because if we weren't right, we wouldn't be at capacity, we wouldn't be sold out. Some of you are on allocation right now where we can't get your you know, hardware fast enough. Uh, these are actually great problems to have because the market's maturing. Um, it'd be a much, much different problem if we had a bunch of extra inventory and the market wasn't buying what we were doing. Um, we're right in the middle of the hype cycle and about to go mainstream, and we know that the strategy is working. But more importantly, there's another strategy to come that you'll hear more about that will, again, take another 10, 12 years in our evolution, where once we have all you connected on the network, we think we can change the way the world does business. Why does data go in and out of every ERP system? Why does everybody create an order? Why does everyone create an invoice? And why are there seven to 15 payment cycles that exist in a global trade transaction? If everybody knows who's shipping what to whom, and everybody knows what they're supposed to do, there really could be one system of record that's not an ERP system, but it's a supply chain system of record, the system of record that knows that the order was placed, it knows that the factory needs to fulfill the order, it prints the labels, it labels the boxes, it authenticates and encrypts the data. You know, the etching of what's supposed to happen is stored in a database. The stamping is when that etching is applied. You know, if you understand a stamp, how a stamp is made with an etching, and once we have the etching of what's supposed to happen in the supply chain, I ordered 15 units, it's supposed to ship on Tuesday, it's supposed to go FedEx, it's supposed to clear customs, it's gonna have this broker, this forwarder. Once you know all that, you have that etching, there's really no reason why you just can't have event-driven data, collecting data all over the supply chain, and automating that whole transaction process that today is not automated. And that could really make a difference. That could ex really make a difference. And it's what we are going to do. It is in our plans. And hopefully, you know, some of you will join that journey. When you're two years into it, it's usually 20 or 30 customers that we work with that are highly innovative, that want to do things that have never been done before. At 10 years in the journey, it's usually most of our customer base really seeking a solution from the best supplier possible. And usually at the end of the journey, it's all the very small enterprises that are very manually oriented who just want it to be as easy and pain-free as possible. From the innovator who wants to have lots of pain and lots of gain, you know, to this person who wants to consumerize the, the business application. And that's really our cycle. And this is kind of, you know, where we are. So now that we've arrived seven and a half years into our RIMS plan and two and a half years into our stamp plan, um, I really wanted to address, from my opinion, why we've been so successful. Because we have been very, very successful. And we're only successful because our customers are successful. It's pretty, pretty simple. Um, but our customers have chosen our company for specific reasons. And what I'm trying to do is, in my mind, document you know, what I think the recipe was and share with you, you know, what has been our journey from 2004. The first thing I believe is that a company, if you want to build a company for life, you need to have a mission. You definitely need a vision, but culture matters enormously. It's actually really the most important secret sauce. Besides having a plan, having a plan is critical. And personally, I believe if you have a plan, you need to use frameworks to communicate that plan so that everybody can buy into your vision and, 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 and deal with your plan. 
But you have to start with the question, which is how to build a company for life. Because um, uh, we, we being you know, the collective employees that, that, that make de up Descartes and our customers' uh, steering groups, uh, we don't really want to just build some company like most tech companies and build it up for five or seven years and then sell it to someone. Um, you know, God bless we ever sold to one of the big guys, you know, my customers, when they speak with us, they'd say that they're afraid that they'll be marginalized. I mean, imagine us part of an Oracle or some big company, and, and then, then we would just be the logistics checkbox in some giant business. And, and we really believe in what we do, and we want to build something that lasts forever, and we don't really want to be marginalized. We think our profession is highly important and very critical and don't want to be subsumed. So we didn't start off saying, how can I build a little TMS business and get $20 million worth of revenue and then go sell the thing to Oracle? We didn't, we didn't wake up like that. We woke up saying, how can we create a business where when I'm driving down the street with my son and he looks at his son and he says, you know, your grandfather, daddy, he built that. And, you know, I've wanted that for all of our employees. And some of those folks that are here in this room have joined me on this journey over 20 years ago, long before Descartes. This timeline, there's a few guys who've been with me almost for the, the whole journey. And, you know, and every year, the number of people walking down the trail, joining us in our journey, is growing. And it's growing for a set of reasons. And what I wanted to do today as part of the branding exercise is try to expose these reasons to all of you so that you can kind of understand, like underneath what we do every day, you know, is a set of concepts that create the company. The first is the mission. And the mission is really to make our world a better place. We have two major issues facing us as in the profession that we're in. One is we need to make society more productive. Anybody who really understands what happens in global trade and how data flows and the filings that we do and the security work that we do and the broker forwarding stuff that we make, and if you really understand that whole world, what you really know is, is it's still very inefficient. And logistics is the backbone of commerce. It is the backbone of commerce. And it is very inefficient. And in a world where fundamentally sales are going down, resources are becoming more scarce, so that basically means that costs are going up and volumes are going down, we are going to have to be more efficient. And this isn't at a company level, it's at a societal level. If we look at third world countries and the need for food, it's not that we don't have that food, it's we can't get the food there. We have problems with the distribution of food. We don't have a problem with finding the food. We have a problem with getting the food where it's supposed to be. This is a societal problem. We even have a bigger problem, which is almost more of an unfortunate problem, which is beyond society, there's a need to protect civilization. We have people in the world who would like nothing better to have a bomb go off in one of the airplanes and start a world war. And they wake up every day, and I guarantee you, there are people who are waking up every day trying to blow up a ship, trying to blow up a plane, trying to sneak something across the Canadian border. For some reason, everyone is convinced it's coming through Canada into the US, and I don't know why that is, because, you know, but it is. That's what they think. So our, the Canadian-US border gets a lot of scrutiny. Um, it's not a bad thing for us, by the way, but that's another comment. Um, but actually, it's extremely important. You know, very recently, a couple of our customers had bombs on their planes. Now, again, I, I think I confessed earlier during my Hail Mary, I'm a Jewish guy, so I'm going to walk you through this a minute. But how many people do you know that would be Jewish, that would live in Chicago, that would buy their toner cartridges for their copy machines in Yemen and ask them to be shipped 
to the synagogue. Works for me. Yeah, you know, look, I'm a freaking copier. run out of some toner cartridge. I think I'm going to order some. It looks like, oh, look at this. I'm online. Look at this. There's this really cool toner remanufacturer who's in Yemen. And no, not only that, why would I don't need it at my house. I go to the synagogue every Saturday. I think I'll pick it up there. And, and then they all look at each other and say, how come nobody caught this? Like, like, how obvious is this? I mean, like, you know, I'm sorry, but... Pretty obvious to me. We don't got a lot of friends in Yemen in the shipping corner cartridges to my synagogue. I mean, it's just not really on. And, and uh, so afterwards, we get to have lovely meetings with all of these people. You know, this is like acronym soup. You know, TSA, DHS, you know, CBP, Cross-Border Protection, Department of Homeland Security, Transportation Safety Administration. Everyone's looking at each other and saying, hey, you know what? We, 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 need, to, we need to figure out who's shipping this stuff. Because right now, all we do is get the data from the forwarder. We really don't know what the forwarder's consolidating. We don't really know where it come from. Sound familiar to anybody who's in this business? I mean, yes, we don't know. The forwarder does what he does, and the shipper is blind, and he puts it on the airline because no one trusts each other. The airline don't want to know who the shipper really is, and the forwarder doesn't want really to know, and nobody wants to share, and it sounds like the Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marines, or Walmart and any one of its suppliers. I mean, it's just the same thing again where a whole bunch of people need to work together, no one really trusts each other enough, they're not sharing information, and someone's scratching their head trying to figure out how they missed the toner cartridges coming from Yemen. And of course, you know, when I think about it, I'm like, wouldn't it just be great if every computer in the world was connected to our network and they knew who we were and we could authenticate what they is and they'd have a known location and we'd make sure they enter all the shipment and data in there and then we would see that it just doesn't make a lot of sense that people are ordering toner cartridges from Yemen and maybe we should like check out those boxes. Like, how hard would that be? Now, the reality is it's really not that hard because everybody has packing lists anyway. You know, if we have to, we set up data center where we start keying in packing lists. That'd be a good business. Matter of fact, I think I just invested in one, but that's another story. Or we could ask anybody who has a computer to, like, download a barcode that represents something that was shipped to him from his order and start creating the stamp. All right, now, I'm not going to sell 15 years out yet. What I just want to say is, is that the reality is, is this stuff is going to make our world a better and safer place. You know, anybody can stand up and say, I can build a WMS system for you guys, and, you know, you can buy my TMS and, you know, see my stuff, and, you know, here I am. Uh, we didn't want to build that company. We wanted to build a company that had a completely different relevance, a company that could make a difference by putting an electronic backbone across the world that could actually make society more productive, that could actually help secure civilizations. And this is our mission, and this is our journey. And, you know, we're glad to have you join us in the journey. What makes a company successful, in my mind, is having a very defined mission, and a very defined vision, and a very defined plan, and sticking to them. You know, there was a, a joke about a company in Canada called BC Emerges. A guy did his MBA on how many times in a year they would change their strategy and tracked how they changed their strategy against their stock price and how there was a direct correlation between each new boilerplate and a decrease in the share price because they kept reinventing the next, the next thing and it really wasn't a company that was grounded. Our, our desire to make a world a better place comes from a very defined form, which is to unite business in commerce. And, and uniting business in commerce has a lot to do with scale. You know, the ability to really get the global logistics network to do what we want it to do, you know, requires us to have 68%, you know, like most shipments from most major forwarders run through our network. You know, most of the shipments that run in the Canadian border are so small, the carrier does it on the free system from the government. Like I know you guys, some of you may know, we run AES Direct for the US government, which is the free shipment for small guys. And then the stuff with the big guys, most of it is running through us. And when most of it's running through one place, governments have a much better view of what's going on and a much greater ability to protect their society. And, 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 and this notion of uniting business and commerce starts from one very simple perspective, which is it is our job to help you, our customers, deliver to your expectations. It's not about just, you know, putting the goods in the truck. You're all in business 
of delivering customer satisfaction. And you're all logistics intensive industries. If you weren't logistics intensive industries, you wouldn't be here. And because of that, your ability to sell service and satisfaction at a fair price and a fair profit directly hinges on your ability to execute as an operator. Very direct correlation between your company's performance and your internal performance. And to help you deliver to your goals is our primary objective. So our mission is to help customers deliver by uniting them in commerce to make the world a better place. It's actually somewhat simple, somewhat simple, but big, but big. Now our vision is to unite the world through a multi-party platform, through this one place where you can go, where you can have your data and you can share data and then you can access public data, like a tariff filing as an example. And this vision really started from understanding deregulation, that if you apply Moore's law and the theory of history kind of into the logistics world, what you will see is that the logistics industry, once it's deregulated, will continue to get more fragmentation and will continue to get more specialization. And as the world goes global, you don't know what you don't know. When you go to a new country, you partner with somebody who does forwarding or logistics in that country. You go global, the next thing you know, you got 16 or 24 partners, and they're all specialized. And by having more specialization and all of these smaller businesses that were highly specialized, it would mean that they need to be networked together, that form needed to follow function. And then if every government had their own hours of service rule just to manage a trucker and you run a global company, the next thing you know, you got you know, 24 governments you got to connect to all with a different derivative of how to tell a driver whether he's been sleeping or not sleeping and whether he braked too fast or what his fuel taxes were. You know, they're all the same problem and if every country's got their own standard, then there needs to be a network. So for us, the vision was we have a vision of a world united where all the trading partners are connected. And, and, and that's our vision. And it's been our vision for seven and a half years. It's been a journey of 27 years. Now, culture matters a lot. And in, in our view, um, the unique situation that we found ourselves in was, once again, how do we really make a difference? How can we really be relevant? Uh, 2004, we set forth this strategy that was, if it didn't work, you don't have to pay. You know, we're going to put it in. You're going to pay us per month. If you don't like it, you're going to quit paying us. And if you like it, you're going to pay us per month. And if you use it and you don't pay us, we're going to shut it off. And life would be pretty binary, that we're not going to create a culture of selling. Some of you have engaged with us where, you know, someone comes in and says, I got this big project I want to do. And we come in and say, that's great, but we don't want to do it. We just want to do this little project over here because we like to build incrementally off success and we don't like really big things because we like to build incrementally on success and we don't want to sell you anything. We just want to serve you, make it work, reinvest the savings into future business. So we had to change the culture of the company from a culture of serving, I mean from a culture of selling to a culture of serving. Many of you have been part of a pilot process with us where, you know, until it's right, you don't move forward, and our job isn't to sell you anything, it's to just make it work. And I actually think this is the most important thing in the company, and the most important thing about network computing and federated computing is these become utilities, and they either work or they don't. And it becomes very binary, and it's really not about selling a field of dreams, it's about processing your transactions in a multi-party network. Good companies need to have a plan, and we have a plan. Uh, it's called buy and build. Um, really, this is about accelerating your time to value. You know, the best way that we can get you better results faster is to find really good products with really good little companies that we can acquire and make part of us and give you immediate access to those applications in your environment. And this, this is really important because it allows us to have the, a broader platform to give you more product choices and most importantly accelerate the speed to which you can get to find benefit. Now, 
I also believe that you need to have frameworks, that frameworks guide organizations. And besides having a mission and a vision and a culture and a plan, you need to have a way to package that together and communicate to people. And you need to create frameworks. The most important framework in our company is what's happening today, which is our user group, as part of one learning team, you know, has made us a great business. The number of you that are now joining our journey is amazing. And the culture framework is something that, again, seven, or seven and a half years ago, I presented this to the management team when I was asked to, you know, catch the burning medicine ball, as I say, and, 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 fi and fix, fix uh, what I knew was a great company with great people. And it really was pretty simple. If I could just get everyone to work together, uh, I figured they'd pretty much solve all the problems that we had. And uh, uh, I think that's just been the case. Um, by getting everyone to work together, um, they've solved all the problems that we've had. And we talk about the culture framework in our company, one learning team being one networked enterprise, our customers, our stakeholders. We're all, we're all one. Our shareholders, the analyst firms. Uh, I meet with a lot of my shareholders. I have a lot of conversations. The analysts do, we do. We have customer relationships, vendor relationships. We all need each other. And it all works well when everybody recognizes that they need each other. It usually doesn't work so well when one person thinks they're a little more or less important than all the rest. But when you really realize how you all need each other and that we're all in ecosystems together, uh, things work pretty well. And in terms of our corporate culture, we expect, you know, one networked enterprise. As far as our individual culture framework on what we expect individuals from their behavior internally on their, we expect everyone to listen, to educate others, to article, which means write, publish, articulate, teach, to research, and the network. And if we can be a learning organization, as Jack Welch said, we can be worth more than the sum of our parts. Very classic MBA question was asked is how do you make a holding company work worth more than the sum of their parts? The question was raised to Jack Welch, CEO of GE. His response was by having a learning organization. And I agree with that. And by creating that learning organization, uh, we have a, a framework for the culture of what we expect from an individual. But when we're one networked enterprise at a corporate culture and we have a learning culture as an individual, you also need a another piece of culture. You need that piece of culture is your individual behavior as you work with everyone else. And, and that's the team framework. And the team framework is really about personality. It's about being transparent, not managing in denial, accepting the facts. I had a very good customer last year come up and tell me that we had a lot of stuff go wrong and that he had never seen a company like ours work so hard to make it right and never once was there, it wasn't me, it was you, it was only we have to figure this out. And I was very proud to hear because I do believe the true judge of a culture of a company like this isn't about what happens when we sell it to you. It's how we behave when something goes wrong and how our customers behave when something goes wrong. And when we really understand we're all in it together and we all need each other and we keep everything fair-sided, we always fix it. We do get there. And we've got a lot of customers in this room been with us 15, 20 years and you know that we get there. And you get there by being transparent and you can't manage in denial. And entrepreneurial spirit or entrepreneurial enthusiasm, as I like to say, is something that I learned from a presentation that Steve Jobs made many, many years ago when he was doing a documentary on the Next Step operating system. When I was building systems for US military, I had the privilege of using the Next Step operating system and had the experience of spending some time listening to Steve Jobs. And there was a point in his company where one of his employees walked into his office and said, I'm out of pencils, we need to buy, you know, please tell the secretary to order 24 pencils. And he was pretty pissed off, you know, because he didn't want to have graduated to the point where 
we were ordering office supplies through the commissary. And he looked at the individual and he said, why don't you go out and make a sales call? And you know when you sign into the reception desk and you put your name in there, just look at the lady nicely and say, do you mind? Just put that pen in your pocket and save us from buying 24 pence. That's kind of entrepreneurial spirit. Now, I'm not advocating that we go steal pens, okay? But I think we get the point of how we need to behave. Now, it does help to have a plan, and we have a plan, and we're going to talk a lot in the next two days about how we're seven and a half years into the RIMS plan. And it looks great, guys. I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff here. I don't need to show you all the cool stuff because I know you're all going to go see it. But it is very clear that the hardware and software and networks and the proliferation of the microprocessor and the ubiquitousness of wireless networks and the notion of presence on a network, that those three things have collided as we forecasted to create new generation of shared social systems that can interoperate across a community ubiquitously and then with the rapid cost degeneration of hardware that we can now afford to put very sophisticated hardware and software network systems and global distributed deployments with tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands to billions of messages, uh, all interconnected globally, and the time is now. Now, in, besides having a planning framework and a cultural framework, we need to have an operating framework. And our operating framework is very simple. And we, may, we want to make sure that you all know what it is because in the end of the day, it's our responsibility. This is what we have to deliver to our shareholders. And the only way we can deliver this to our shareholders is if you guys are successful and we have your support and we want, we'd like you to know what it is. And our operating plan is to grow our EBITDA per share 10 to 15% of the year. That's what joining the journey brings all of us. And our financial framework is to return invested capital in five years or less across the portfolio. So those are our frameworks. And with these frameworks, we've built the company that you see today. And how are we doing? Well, you know, we're, we're, as you can see, we're, we're doing very well. Um, this is the scorecard, being accountable, metrics driven, focused on results. Uh, this gives us an EBITDA per share growth rate of over 20% for a seven year period. And we have delivered every quarter for 28 quarters. There's some wood around here somewhere. Um, trying to knock it. Someone knock on every you will knock on wood for us. Uh, and hopefully that, that trend will, will continue. Uh, but it is on the back of your success. Uh, and I hope you're, you can take pride in looking at this the way we take pride in it. It's because of what you've done that we've been able to build a company that over seven years has exceeded Wall Street's expectations uh, every, every single quarter. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't want to say who it was, but one of our customers came up last night to me and said, you know, after your user group conference last year, I, I bought a bunch of your stock. And, uh, you know, knowing where we were a year ago and where we are today, you, you did pretty good. And uh, that, 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 that we're happy to hear that. We, we would love to think that all of our customers can make their own personal investments in our company and that we can, you know, make you more wealthy and make you more satisfied by not only joining our journey, um, but participating in investing capital the, the way our shareholders do. Um, again, being metrics driven, focused on results, I'm pretty proud to deliver you a company uh, that you've given us. Uh, by your experiences that has been a financial bellwether. So now we're at a position where we're really able to start leveraging our innovation. We have a plan, we have a strategy, we have a culture framework, we have a mission, we have a vision, we have results, we have shareholders backing, we have cash in the bank, and we now have the broadest and most comprehensive logistics platform in our industry. And now we really want to start to put the pedal down, to extend ourselves to really go after being the leader in these industries. And most importantly is this platform. Uh, many of you have seen us put the pieces together and now we have begun really putting all those pieces together in a common platform. 
where we're fusing our applications, the hardware, software, and network on the wireless side, and connecting it to 7,000 people around the world to create the, the largest network, to really go after that scale and mass, that ability to impact civilization, to make society more productive. Uh, we need to do this at a scale that is like the scale we're doing. And now we have that opportunity to go forward. It, you know, I said it kind of simply the other day is, you know, we got all the ingredients in the cake and we've got the cake mold and the cake mold is, you know, working really well. We just need to put all the ingredients in the cake mold and then we need to let it cure. Bake it, cure it, whatever word you want to use. And then there's just this moment where we're going to have the cake. You know, what this really is about for us is now, how do we create new business processes? Um, over the past year, we've had some really interesting innovations. Um, uh, you can learn more about it in the working sessions, but we define new standards between the air freight industry, the freight forwarding industry, and the government. We've actually changed the way the business process works in air filings and have a much more efficient and effective and productive way to do the work and that standard really was created by this community getting together and figuring out that it was really stupid for one guy to file the stuff at 25 bucks manually when we could probably file electronically for a lot less. But everyone had to change the way they worked to get that done. We've got another example where we're working with the LTL community and we're creating visibility and inbound flow so that we can pull the flow of goods on an inbound basis so that we can pull it through the LTL houses without having to go to trap trailers and just having all trap trailers just dumped at DCs. I mean, these are new things never been done before that couldn't have been done without a group of people working together to create new business processes. And getting more connectivity, getting more customers, getting more people on, the pro on our products, buying more companies, enlarging the community, you know, all this strategy together comes together and now allows us to deliver here and show you at this conference, you know, the most comprehensive platform to manage logistics processes, you know, all under, you know, one roof and one umbrella. And, and it's all because of you guys. I mean, this is a network business. This isn't really about me or our company. It's about you. This is what you've done. And as you see, there's some great customers here. And this is our user group, and we're one learning team. So because we're one learning team, we've got some work to do because there's some new people here. So I, you're, a couple of you guys are going to look at me funny for doing this, but I'm going to do it. I'd like to ask the individuals from Medline, Cabela's, NEC, Group Plaza, and Irving to stand up. And the reason I come on, I want you guys to stand up. And the reason I want you guys to stand up is I want everyone else to look at these guys. This is what you call the newbies. Okay, now we want to make sure they're taken care of, right? We have guests in our house. They're new, they've joined our journey. So do me a favor for everyone. Please make a chance to introduce yourself to these folks because you never know what you might learn and you never know how you might help them learn. What I do know is that they're all new and that they want to join our journey and they can, I'm quite sure from some of you have things to learn. So if I could please just ask you to reach out to our, our new customers and, and make them feel at home and be available to help them learn and uh, if you would do the same thing, yeah, they might find that they can learn from you and who knows, maybe some of you can do business together. Maybe we can get Capella's to sell some Medline stuff and uh, you know, put it on an NEC kiosk. I have no idea. But you know, if you all work together, I'm pretty sure you can do things uh, that we couldn't do on our own. So welcome to our new customers. And uh, I look forward to hearing back from all of you about how well you've gotten to you know, work with all the rest of, uh, of our users. So, um, thanks to our customers, and please take care of their new ones. I'd like to thank our sponsors. Um, you know, it, it's great to have an ecosystem of partners to, to work with. Um, we, don't, we don't get there on our own either. Um, and being able to work with world-class leaders to, who join our journey, um, you know, is great. And uh, I, I look forward again, uh, the, we have a fair tomorrow. Um, I, I'm sorry, this, this evening. 
and you're going to get an opportunity to meet our partners, and, and please do so. Once again, I think we all have something to learn from them, and uh, I think it would be great if everyone gives them an opportunity um, to work with us as one learning team. Um, on a conference basis, just to you know, walk through, through where we're at, um, we got some pretty good speakers coming. I'm real happy that, again, at the industry standard setting level, uh, we're going to hear from Annette, who, who, who deals with the CSA initiatives. These are very important in terms of regulation that's going to be impacting the carrier community. And uh, we're, we're going to have good representation also from Balka White at, on E-Freight. I mean, E-Freight. Look, it's real simple. Someone woke up one day and said, wouldn't it be great if all this stuff was automated? We couldn't agree more. We're a long way from there. In order for that to happen, a whole bunch of people need to work together. That work is starting. We have probably the largest constituency in the world that can influence that work. So by organizing yourselves into peer groups, and we will be having peer group sessions, we want to start leveraging your customer base at a policy and standard setting level with governments and IATA and et cetera. Because if somebody's gonna pass a law and say to do something, if this group don't wanna do it, you probably shouldn't do it because this group represents like 60, 70% of the cargo that flows around out there. So uh, we need to start you know, showing our influence at, you know, at, a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a lot, at a lobby level. And, and then Jim Blazer's gonna be here, um, American Shipper. We, we, we have a study, an uh, intermodal study that is being international transportation study that we're sponsoring again as a learning organization. Uh, we're trying to work with the trades and uh, learn more about what needs to be done um, to manage international trade efficiently. So, but some very good speakers who are really, you know, trying to work with us and we're trying to work with them at a policy level. It's a different level of relevance, it's a much more important level of relevance, which is how can we really address issues at a policy level where we as one learning team and our partnership can influence new business processes or new government regulations and, and, and hope you, you have a great conference. I um, appreciate for you for listening. It's a little longer than normal as they wanted to get the tape of the Descartes story. So uh, I, I hope you, uh, I appreciate your indulgence if you will. And I'd um, like to thank you again, and I can't stress enough, enough how important it is uh, for you guys to, to all learn from each other and, and to work as one learning team. And uh, thanks for joining, you know, me, per thanks for joining me on this journey and, and our company. Um, it's just been, been fantastic. And um, if the next seven years can look like the last seven, uh, we're going to have a, an, an amazing business that Every one of us and all of you can look at your children and let them know that what you helped build because it's on your back that we're building it. So thanks a lot, everyone, and have, have a nice day.